Ms. Hillel Neuer, I'm the Executive Director of UN Watch. We are gathered here for an information meeting on the Universal Periodic Review of the Islamic Republic of Iran. As most of you know, tomorrow the Islamic Republic of Iran will be appearing upstairs at the Human Rights Council to present its national report uh, and to receive questions and recommendations from the diplomatic community. Um, we have gathered with us an eminent panel of distinguished guests who've come from near and far to be with us here today to shed light uh, on this subject uh, the day before Iran itself speaks. Uh, I'll introduce our speakers in a moment. I'll just say a word about the report. This is the report that Iran has submitted. It's the national report uh, of Iran submitted this summer and which they will be presenting orally tomorrow and it is the basis of tomorrow's Universal Periodic Review. Let me quote from you a few segments from the report. The report tells us that, quote, the laws of Iran repudiate all forms of torture. Well, we have with us uh, at least one torture victim who will tell you, uh, shed light on what she thinks about that statement and its credibility. We have in the report the statement that, quote, Iran has tire tirelessly worked to advance women's rights. And I think we'll hear from the whole panel, we'll hear from someone who is a lawyer for a woman who was just executed uh, on Saturday, um, and, and from Marina, we'll hear a lot about how Iran works tirelessly to advance women's rights. The report tells us that, quote, in order to protect the rights of the people, the supreme leader has communicated the following general policies in 2014, including the need to fulfill the legal and religious rights of women, and the protection of legitimate freedoms and the protection of the nation's fundamental rights. We also learn in the report, quote, in all stages of prosecution, including detection, investigation, and implementation of sentencing, irrespective of race, religion, gender, or ethnicity, fairness is of paramount importance. And we'll hear from some individuals who serve time in Evan Prison about how fairness is of paramount importance in the legal process in Iran. Uh, two more quotes and then I'll turn it over to the panel. The report tells us, quote, consistent with Article 14 of the Constitution, the government is required to treat non-Muslims with respect and Islamic justice and equity and to respect their human rights. Finally, we learn in the report that, quote, Alongside the recognized religious minorities, the rights of all citizens, including the followers of the Baha'i sect, are respected." End quote. I would now like to turn uh, the microphone over to our panel, and I'll introduce uh, each one uh, individually. I'll just mention their names first. We have Muhammad Mustafa, who will be first, uh, following uh, Muhammad will be Sorab Amari on our right. and. And in the middle, we'll hear from Marina Nemat. Uh, and finally, we'll hear from our, our last speaker, who's still traveling and will be here shortly, uh, Sepide Puragai. Uh, let me begin by introducing our first speaker. Mohammad Mustafai is a human rights lawyer from Iran. He is famous for having defended uh, dozens of inmates who are on death row in Iran. And he's a, a longtime opponent of the death penalty. Um, he was the lawyer, the first lawyer for Rehana Jabari, a woman of 26 years old who was just executed on Saturday for allegedly having killed the man who was trying to rape her. This was a, a world famous case that has been in the headlines for the past week and, and before that. And, uh, and I think we'll, all of us want to hear from someone who was her lawyer who, who knows her case, who, kn who met her, who knows what she went through, and to tell us uh, about this from your first-hand perspective will be <coughs> invaluable for us and for the international audience that will be seeing this uh, on the internet uh, this afternoon. Um, Mr. Mustafa uh, was forced to flee Iran because of his work defending uh, these victims. Uh, he fled to Norway where he created uh, the Universal Tolerance Organization. He is the founding director. And in 2011, he was awarded 
the Ossietsky Prize of Penn, the Organization for the Defense of, of Writers. Uh, with that, I give the floor over to Mohammed. I'll just ask him to turn on the microphone. And please, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, today, I would like to uh, yeah, talk about uh, death penalty because of uh, my background in Iran. Uh, honestly, I had uh, a lot of cases, uh, more than 200 cases about death penalties. I uh, accepted uh, these accusers and uh, offenders to uh, work on their cases inside Iran. Uh, I could say a lot of uh, I, I could say a lot of uh, my clients inside Iran, and unfortunately, uh, someone uh, were executed in Iran, like Delara Darabi, like Behnut Shojai, like uh, uh, last one uh, Rehanel Jabari. Uh, after the uh, revolution uh, of 1979. Not only did that uh, the number of executions uh, decreased, but also the number of crimes uh, with execution punishment increased uh, in Iran. Like drug traffic, like uh, journal execution. Before uh, before 1979, we had not juvenile execution, but after that we uh, had. To an execution, execution for children un under 18 years old. But fortunately, in 2010, uh, Iranian uh, parliament adopted a new penal code and uh, limit the execution for children. But we had, uh, we we didn't had have a uh, stoning punishment in Iran. But after the revolution, we uh, uh, we had the stoning punishment, but in the new penal code also we have a stoning punishment. Uh, in, in Iran, uh, unfortunately again, uh, on Saturday uh, in the morning, uh, according to my opinion, intelligence service in Iran executed Rehan Jafari because Rehani Chabadri's case uh, created a lot of attention inside Iran and outside Iran. A lot of uh, authorities, a lot of actors and uh, lawyers and also a lot of famous people tried to save Rehani Chabadri. But uh, because of the power in Iran uh, on Saturday, Rehani Chabadri executed. I accepted Rehani Jabari's case in 2007 uh, when uh, she was uh, in investigations. And uh, uh, from arresting and uh, until, uh, until execution, in the all process of the court, all process of the execution, uh, uh, all process of the uh, investigation, and of course, Rehane said, I defend myself uh, and Mr. Sarbandi, murder, wanted to rape me. And we had a lot of reasons for this uh, client. One reason was being condom uh, at the home. And uh, one reason, reason uh, was uh, the uh, empty apartment, the apartment that Mr. Sarbandi invited uh, Rehane uh, was empty and nobody lived uh, there uh, in the, at the apartment and uh, a lot of reasons uh, we mentioned but uh, because, uh, because of the uh, actually Mr. Sarbandi uh, was a member of the intelligence service and, uh, and his friend, uh, Mr. Sheikhi, was also a member of the intelligence service. Rehane uh, explained about their situation and their condition, her situation and her condition, and explained about, uh, uh, about the, 
the condition uh, at the apartment, but uh, nobody believed uh, this uh, crime, and also the, because of any reasons, uh, the court in Iran uh, convicted her to death penalty. And then uh, we tried to save it, but unfortunately uh, we couldn't. Uh, you, you can read uh, Rehane's uh, story uh, online in the internet. Uh, one, I, I want to say about death penalty. Iran, Iran will say uh, death penalty is uh, a right according to uh, according to Quran and according to Sharia law. But I, I want to say, no, it's a, a part of the uh, crimes. We can say it is according to the Quran and Sharia law. And most of the crimes are not according to the Sharia law. For example, we have a uh, death penalty for drug. We had a drug trafficking in, uh, in Islam's uh, time in Prophet Muhammad's time, uh, and also one most important issue is uh, lacking uh, intention in the in the crimes. In the murder cases, if a person kills another person without uh, intention, judges can uh, can convict him or her to death penalty. It is big uh, problem in Iran, and 90 more than 90 percent of uh, execution executions are because of this issue and uh, uh, and also Rehan Jabari convicted to death penalty and in the uh, under the and the sentence the judge written Mr. Jabari Mrs. Jabari has not uh, intention in this case but uh, the action was uh, according to the uh, according to the penal, uh, uh, criminal law, is the death penalty. It is a murder case. But this is uh, about death penalty. I uh, I hope uh, with a good strategy and with a good uh, pressure on the Iranian government, we could uh, limit and uh, and um, eliminate the death penalty in Iran. I I uh, I'm sure we can if. If Iranian government uh, stop the death penalty, I am sure we can improve human rights in Iran and we can, imp uh, we can increase the uh, death penalty issue in Iran. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now give the floor to Sohrab Amari. Let me first say a few words about Sohrab. Um, so, Reb is the London-based is a London-based editorial page writer for the Wall Street Journal. He is the co-editor of Arab Spring Dreams, an anthology of essays by young dissidents in the Middle East. He was formerly uh, one of the books editors uh, at the Wall Street Journal when he first joined. Uh, he holds a law degree, and uh, he, Mr. Amari was born in Tehran. And he has his own experiences as a youngster when he was interrogated by Iranian security officials as a child because he had accidentally brought a videotape, a film of Star Wars uh, to school. And it was a time when, when having Western films was some, apparently some kind of crime. Um, so, uh, so even as a youngster, Sohrab, before he left Iran, had experienced some of the very uh, cruel aspects of this regime. Uh, with that, I, I turn the floor over to Sorab. Well, thank you, um, uh, Hillel, and um, uh, thank you also to UN Watch for, for inviting me. Um, let me also just say a, a, a word of thanks uh, to the organization for the work that it does of, of keeping uh, the United Nations bound, or at least trying to uh, measure its performance against uh, against its own charter. Um, let me also thank my fellow panelists. Um, it's a real honor to, to share this, the, the panel with them. I, I'll be the first to say that uh, I've not experienced um, firsthand the, the level of, 
repression that they've experienced and seen in Iran. I was I left the country when I was uh, 13 um, and came to the United States. And even when I was living in the country, my parents did their best to, to shield me from from the more cruel aspects of living under the Islamic Republic. That said. Uh, Hillel did mention that the Star Wars experience, a few years after that, this was maybe a few months before I, I left the country for good and have not been back. Uh, my uh, parents and I were driving back from the north of Iran, it's a very uh, uh, common thing to do, which is to, to, to go to the north for a vacation on our, on our way back. Um, a um, security checkpoint stopped us. And essentially, you know, there was, we had, my parents hadn't drunk, there was no drunk driving. The point of the, the affair was to make sure that their relish, relationship was not illicit and therefore that I was not an illegitimate kid. And so therefore I was, I was placed under this really strong light and a guy read this number and I can't remember what it was, it was like 15566. Does that number <clears throat> mean anything to you, Sora? And uh, I, I, I didn't remember and he was like, well, that's your dad's identity card number. <laughs> What does that say about you? Uh, anywho, we, we so we we made that we made uh, we passed that experience. No one was arrested, but that's just the tip of the iceberg of the sort of experiences that millions of Iranians uh, deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Some more extreme than others. So uh, when we come to, to to this document, this really is a really obscene document, and um, I, I hope and pray, but I I, I suspect that the process of the UPR will be, for the Islamic Republic, will be an obscene experience as well because it'll allow dictators to, to pat themselves on the back uh, while they stand in judgment of real democracies. For, for example, so for example, what would Norwegian women do if it weren't for Saudi Arabia and the People's Republic of China 